I'd love to introduce my uh, good friend and the co-founder of Design by Rhode Island and also um, owner and um, president of Libby Slater Interior Design. Um, I invited Libby because she's, uh, she's an interior designer with, um, with a vast background actually from cruise ships to um, restaurants and commercial spaces in inside Rhode Island and throughout New England and New York. And she's been digging into a lot of what we're facing, um, what the restaurant industry and the hospitality industry is thinking about right now. And so thanks, Liv. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. So for me, you know, we asked about design and what's the difference between design and, and art necessarily. So for me, um, design falls within a concepts. I'm, I'm going to talk specifically, I guess, about restaurants. I'm going to talk about restaurants because they have a, um, a little bit of a unique, there's a unique approach to restaurants. Um, when there's concept, functionality, operations, everybody's different. Every menu is different. Every chef is different. Every owner is different. Every target market is different. And so we have to understand that and we have to design a space that works for the function and the concept of, of what the vision is for the particular person. And then on the other side of that are the aesthetics, the user experience, and the impact that this, this place makes. Um, and user experience, Lisa had mentioned it, how important that is. Um, and you know, we as designers have been thinking about that for a long time. Um, but I think now with technology, and again, she mentioned it as well, the, tech, the development of technology has made us more aware of the end user and user experience because it's almost immediate in, in, in a lot of ways. The VCR, right? There, I, I think that there's probably some people um, that are here that remember a VCR in their home. And it was always stuck at 12 o'clock, right? Because a VCR was designed by an engineer, not by a designer. It was innovative, new technology, all of that, but it was really, really, really difficult to operate if you're just trying to set the timer. Whereas now we're like, inundated with these Apple products where almost anyone could develop an app or could, um, you know, it's like technology is just such a part of our lives now. Whereas like during the VCR time, maybe, you know, we'd have an on and off switch for something or, um, you know, maybe you'd have like a fancy camera or something like that, but that was probably it. Now everything, is on our phone. We have a television on our phone practically, you know, it's like um, cameras, movies, you can do anything with it. So if you're thinking about an experience of a restaurant, we're going out to eat, being social, being with people, having that experience hasn't really changed much over the years. I mean, the concepts have changed, fast food and like all of that kind of stuff, but it's changed a little bit. But even before COVID, I started to see changes in the way that food is delivered and the expectation for how people um, get their food, right? So food delivery services, the Grubhubs and the DoorDashes and the Uber Eats, start, you know, I think somebody developed an app because they were probably like sitting at home watching video games and it was like, I want my food. I want the food from this place, but I don't want to go out there and I don't want to get it. I want somebody to bring it to me. So what happened is that all of these technologies started, but the restaurants aren't really equipped for them. The, the, you know, I was at a restaurant uh, before, you know, the COVID, probably like in February or something like that, there were about four people in the restaurant and there were five different delivery people waiting by the kitchen to take the food out. And as, as a diner, as an experience, as an expected 
dining experience, I didn't really like seeing like the activity of people coming in and out and just standing around and waiting and sitting on their phone. It was just, it was, it was disruptive to what I wanted to have as my dining experience. And so recently, um, I'm designing a restaurant actually in North Smithfield and my client said, I want the delivery people to go to the back door. I want them to come in through the kitchen. I don't want them to come into the dining room because they recognize that as a big potential aspect of their business, but they don't want the dining experience of people who are going there specifically to sit, to eat, to be disrupted by that. Um, if anybody ever goes to um, like Starbucks and they have the app, the Starbucks app on their phone, right? You could see, I noticed this, you may not have even noticed it, but because it became so popular, they had to put up like wire racks in the Starbucks for, for them, like they're like taking any shelving system that they can find to create an area for people to go and to pick up their to go. And so the technology is almost developing faster than what the design of the restaurant and the operations can accommodate for. And so now we have a virus that is going to change the way that we interact, hopefully not forever, but we have to be aware of it. Like Lisa had mentioned about my experience with Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, one thing that Royal Caribbean has to think about is norovirus. And so norovirus on the ships gets passed between people quite quickly. But a lot of the reason why the norovirus became so prominent on these cruise ships, and you hear about it in the news that you know one person got sick and then the whole cruise ship is sick, is the hand sanitizers. So hand sanitizers actually, you know, it kills the good bacteria as well as the bad bacteria. And so if you're, um, don't go into the dining room, you, if you go into the dining room and you're just using the hand sanitizers and not going in and washing your hands or washing your hands after you eat, then you're gonna be more susceptible to this norovirus. So designing for the cruise ships, we had to make sure that every surface, every material, every fabric was able to be wiped down with a bleach solution so that the ships could be cleaned and that they could stop the spread of these neuroviruses, which is gonna be, my experience with that, I think is gonna help my restaurant clients in the future. So another thing that's coming up with the norovirus, and now the, the state of Rhode Island has released their guidelines for opening up for phase one, for um, allowing still for pickup um, by cars, but also um, outdoor seating eight feet apart. This is, a, this is a graph or a plan that was done by an architecture firm in San Francisco. And anybody who's ever worked in the restaurant industry knows that, or you know, has been a part of it, the margins for, for that is so thin, operationally so thin. And so if you see this pre-occupancy, pre-virus occupancy versus the social distance seating, you see that the seat count is 113 versus 32. So your favorite restaurant that you're gonna be going to may have a very different menu when you go back there than what you're used to. And the greatest margins for, um, for food is pizza, right? But you don't want every restaurant to be serving pizza but it's gonna be expensive for them to buy steaks or to buy seafood or it's something like that. So, so the expectations of people and what they're getting at their favorite restaurants may change because, and also some restaurants may not even be able to open in this phase one because um, it may not be worth it for them to bring people back to buy food, to do all of that. So the other thing that restaurants have to do now is they have to have all the individual packets for condiments, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but that can get really expensive for a restaurant. So it's, there's, there's going to be a lot of push and pull as to what a restaurant can afford to do to open during this like 
phase one time and what they can't. But what you can see in the social distance seating here is, um, are the cars, right? Like what I was talking about with the grub hubs and, and all of that. Restaurants are gonna have to have this as a new reality. People are, are, you know, it's been what, like nine weeks now? And people almost have an expectation that they're gonna be able to, to order. And they may even feel more safe that way too. The other thing is friends, it's like, do you feel safe going out to a restaurant? Do you feel safe going out and being in these environments? And the perception of the cleanliness of the restaurants, the way that they're handling the social distancing, the way they're handling um, how your food is served, um, how you're going to pay. How, you know, I mean, thinking about like even just the transaction of your credit card handing it to somebody, having them take it away, give it back to you, that's, you know, that's probably not going to happen anymore. There's going to be new and innovative ways for people to pay. So again, the technology is probably going to rapidly catch up with these, um, you know, with the new normal, which I don't like to say that because I just want the now normal. Um, so this next graphic, I don't know if anybody's, you know, if everybody's seen this, but this is the guidelines that Rhode Island has um, put out for, um, for dining uh, in this phase one that's gonna start on March 18th. Um, you know, if you wanna sit outside, it's gonna be eight feet apart. As humans, we like to be together, right? I mean, we're, I'm very happy seeing everybody's faces here and, and everything, and it feels very social. Um, and I can't wait to be together with everyone, but what is a dining experience gonna feel like when you're eight feet apart from somebody? Is it gonna give you that social feeling that you want, or is it gonna feel like you're in a big empty cafeteria? Um, these are the things that we're gonna think about to try to address to make sure that operationally it works for the restaurant and that they can make money. And then also from a customer perspective, that you're gonna go out and have a good time and, and have that expected dining experience that we're all craving right now. So that's it. Does anybody else, have, anybody have any questions? I, don't, I haven't seen the, if there's any. Uh... One, one question I do have for Libby is, uh, Libby, have you, you know, meal delivery has been growing. You mentioned, you talked about it a little bit. Have you designed any spaces with that in mind, are people starting to come to you um, on how to do that? Because that's only going to grow more in time and also with, with COVID-19. Um, I have not for the delivery, um, but uh, Seven Stars is one of our clients and they are developing an app. They've never had an app before, but they now know that they need to have an app. They're developing that app now and we're developing where we're designing the areas within the restaurants for them to go to pick up and to have those and have those spaces. Um, but no, not for it, not specifically for the delivery, but I was working last year with Tallulah's Taqueria and anybody who's been in Tallulah's knows how small it is. They have people who go in and order and sit down. They have people who have ordered on the app, go in and pick it up. And then they also have people who order on like Grubhub and then the Grubhub people go and they pick it up. So to go into this little space and to be able to guide humans to know where you're supposed to go so you don't go in and like, oh my God, where am I supposed to go? I'm so confused. It's, it's a challenge. And, and that's going to be more and more restaurants are going to have to go in that direction. Um, but Anyway, <laughs> and, and all the food pretty much, I mean, they have four items on the menu, so everything kind of looks the same and to make sure that the right thing gets in the right. Oh yeah. You know, column. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. You have all had that experience where you go home and it's like, you're, you know, everything that you ordered isn't there. I wonder if that's the new social. Um, I did see a post, um, a few people had sent around that there's uh, trying to figure out how to, Fill. This is this is pretty bad. But how to how to fill the um, the seats at the table because they're so far apart. So this one 
restaurant thought it would be great to have mannequins. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. <laughs> terrible and very creepy, but the, um, the loss of that social experience, I think is what a lot of people consider, right? So is there gonna be a different social experience in the pickup or in this other revenue stream, you know, that, you know, I mean, restaurants are designed to turn tables in terms of their business model. Like, how does that affect that business model? Or is it at least helpful because they can't turn as many tables that they can at least have this um, take up? This yeah. yeah. We'll have For the whole turn robot. thing. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Sorry. We'll have social robots. Yeah. <laughs> robots will fill up the space. Yeah. Well, thanks, Liv. That was, that was awesome. It really, uh, yeah, it was great. Um, I'm going to take us to our next uh, speaker, who's Jen Long, and Jen is an industrial designer, mm -hmm. longtime Hasbro designer of My Little Pony, turned environmentalist because who needs all this plastic, <laughs> and um, has been really in these last few years uh, dedicating her um, her skills and her uh, design um, acumen into how to make a better world. And she's gonna talk to us a bit about her background there, but also her pivot and very interesting design for a face cover and um, non-medical grade mask. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Well, it's um, a real honor and delight to be here. So I, I started out as, well, I would say I actually started out as an artist. I knew I was an artist when I saw my first sunset and I couldn't stop drawing it. And I was about seven or eight. And, and whenever I grabbed a pen, I would just draw that sunset over the water of the Lake Erie in Cleveland. Um, but I chose design because I also had some mechanical aptitude um, and I had two kids to raise, and I knew that in order to afford art school, I would need to make a certain amount of income when I got out um, to pay my loans. And so I studied industrial design, and I got hired by Fisher Price, um, and then later Hasbro made me an offer. So um, I picked up my boys and I, and we moved out here to Providence, and that was. 22 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so then I designed for about seven years at Hasbro and then uh, one other company. And then I, my son, Mike, graduated from the same art school I went to. And he's a painter. So he, he got to follow the painting path. And um, I decided it was time to go freelance. And so then I still was doing toys, but it's so funny at that time, I named my company Pivotal Design, and all I hear today is pivot, pivot, pivot. I'm ready to sell it. Anybody want to buy the name? Pivotal. <laughs> I'm ready to pivot to something else. Um, so um, I named it Pivotal because even back then I was thinking I'd like to transition to green and renewable design. But I wasn't really finding my way. I went to all the Better World by Design conferences and things like that. Um, but I just kept staying open. And you know, what 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 is it that I'm really here to be doing? And then I was um, I am, I went to a girls' rock camp, and that opened this whole world of music for me. And um, somehow I started following that path and knew that it wasn't really, um, I went ahead and given up on this idea of finding uh, green design. It was that this might inform that later. And then I had this idea for the whale guitar, which led to Yarrow, which led to me doing this thing. Because Yarrow, was, actually Yarrow was one of the first really big supporters of the whale guitar project. And I'm uh, eternally grateful for that. Um, and and he remembered me about this plastic thing, so then that led to that. So it's, you know, everything's sort of starting to come full circle. And um, so when this COVID crisis started, uh, 
I really just wanted to help sew masks. But the incessant entrepreneurial innovator in me um, just was not satisfied with the available mask designs that were out there. I got as far as this. I downloaded some of the patterns and I pinned them the way you're supposed to pin them. Um, and there were just so many different patterns and so many steps. I just was like, right this is taking too long it's going to take me a day to make one of these and um i really started researching it and i realized there were a lot of people sewing it sewing them so i'm not going to be missed if i take some time to kind of really examine this and see if there was another way to do this and so <clears throat> i talked with my husband who's also a designer and a motorcyclist and he showed me what one of these this is called a Balaclava, and basically this is what my design is based on. And it has a nose piece that is bendable, and it has this sort of kerchief design, and there's some filtering inside of it. And I was like, well, maybe that would be a better way to do this. And so I wore that, but it kept slipping down. And um, I also wanted, you know, like, where am I going to get metal to bend on the nose? And the processes used in these are kind of, they're sophisticated. So how could I make something that um, an everyday sewer or even somebody who couldn't sew could make? And so I did some experimentation. This is one of the first, I'm just going to take you through some design process. This is one of the first ones I made. I didn't realize how close I was with this. I departed from this because this was too flimsy and there was extra sewing, and there was just something about it I didn't like, but I'll get back to this in a little while. And the next one I made <clears throat> was this one, which I, I made fairly from the beginning, and it got a lot of compliments. I showed it on um, Facebook, and I added extra straps to help tie it up to my head. And I thought it was really good because it was closing all these gaps. I was reading about gaps under the eyes and gaps around the side of the face. And I wanted to address those. And also that the ones that have simple ear wraps really irritated people who had to wear them all day long. And so this was a really good solution for that. Um, the only thing was it was too good because this fabric, which is more on the lines of the recommended fabric, is so tight that when I took, I would take these for walks and um, I, I almost passed out from carbon dioxide because I was not able to expel my own carbon dioxide through the mask. So I decided to just to try bandanas because they're a little bit thinner. And so then that was the next step. And I tried a bandana and I also built this foam piece which you can see here, it has this little build out because my husband wears glasses and he was having trouble with it and I wanted it to hold the glasses in place for him. But inside, in between the layers, I started putting filters that are made from reusable um, shopping bags because I did some research online and learned a lot about this fabric that we all have laying around from these bonded, reusable, non-woven shopping bags. And I sew it into a pocket so that you can add more filtering. So if you have some kind of disposable material that you wanted to add, because information was changing daily on what was best. And the shopping bags, they're bonded, they're water resistant. The fact that they're bonded and they're not a regular woven pattern makes an irregular course for the virus to go through. So it act actually traps pretty well, but not as well as they originally thought. Um, but it's still pretty well between two layers of bandana and two layers of filter plus whatever you put in there, you're gonna get a pretty good filtering um, and a good containment. Plus it's one, it doesn't even really need a pattern. Although there was this nose pattern thing and I started working out all these like nose patterns I was like, then I, was, I got to be like, 
do I really need that? Do you really need an added piece to go up just because the thing that's, you know, I was taking my inspiration from definitely had this extra piece that went up. So then I ex started experimenting with just making it straight across and seeing if the bend would push up and sure enough, it really does. You don't, you didn't need, I didn't need to build something up. It would just bend up. And so this was just made out of um, a flannel shirt, which is actually really soft and nice. And some, this stuff that you saw in both of them was craft foam, which is really nice and soft and cushioning and very available at craft stores. And by the time I got to this one, I realized I could get rid of the extra cord and I could run the cord through the pleat there's a pleat here that shapes it to your face so that this cord that holds it over your head and this cord that cinches it here is just one cord going through a pleat that shapes it to your face. And, and that's why I pulled this one back because I had that pleat and I had it open and I was going to add the sew on the tie separately and I, it was right there the whole time that channel that you could just pass that right through. So it's just, it's just kind of be funny sometimes you make things and sometimes things grab right at you. So then this was the last one that I used the craft foam because then I was like, well, that actually isn't, how many people actually just have craft foam laying around at home? So I departed from that to this pattern, which has no craft foam, but this will, form that upward bend. And it's just a pocket that's so, how it centers like that. This is a pocket in here that holds a paper clip that's very deep. I can just tamp it down to make sure the clip in there doesn't want to come out. So um, that became the simplified design and because there's a filter inside gets rolled up with all that, it also forms some padding around your nose. And so that really pretty much became the design. It's got the filter inside. Um, and then I decided these could also be part of my climate action. So you could make a mask that, since we're learning so much about curves, could tell us to flatten the climate curve too. You know, we really need, we're learning about exponential growth and we've got an exponentially growing curve, right? Actually, it started way before this. So who knows where it actually is on any chart. It's off the charts as far as climate goes and carbon dioxide, we really need to start addressing that. So, and also, if you notice that was hand sewn, I completely hand sewed this mask. This one is another hand sewed one, which I um, used as on Zoom with my mother-in-law, taught her how to make them as an exercise to make sure these were actually really makeable by most people. Um, it really requires one, two, three, four lines of stitching and that's it, that's it. And then you bend uh, a wire and put it in the pocket, all the pockets, are lined with the strapping from those bags. So the straps are not wasted. The little channel that the uh, ropes or the cord runs through are also lined with that same strapping to create a little hammock for the cord to run through because it's so strong. The material is really, really strong. and doesn't require any edge treatments. You don't have to roll the hems or anything like that. You just cut and go. This is another hand sewed one that I did just to be short. And then I need one for, for Yarrow because this one is filtered with a Montana cans. That's great. Bag. I made one for Dave's Marketplace. <laughs> it's awesome. And I've made one for Masquerade. 
Awesome. Glam, glimmer, glam. And I also, so I've made about four dozen so far, and I've sent uh, probably six of them to different people in the medical field to test. My sister-in-law is a, is a doctor, and she loves hers. She's been wearing hers to work. She wears, she uses the pocket to put um, one of the uh, surgical masks in the pocket, but she doesn't like the surgical masks themselves. And this helps with the gaps under the eyes. And so um, I'm waiting to hear back on a few more people and I just keep sewing them meanwhile. And hopefully, I don't know, maybe we'll have to do a business accelerator, Lisa, because I know beans about mass producing these things. <laughs> I, I just swear, like, I I'm, yeah, I think <laughs> we're on it. That is amazing, Jen. Thank you so much. There was, so, there was so much, um, activity in the chat while you were going. Um, I think you answered the questions um, mostly, but there was one about the eyeglasses. Um, your current design doesn't have that eyeglass holder because I have one of yours now. But um, I will say, uh, Fran, th that it's, it's really well done because it sits so on your face that it doesn't fog your glasses. And I, feel, I know, Jen, you were really thoughtful about that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and you can adjust that. You can, um, it, it will come with its own wire. You can rebend the wire if you need to. Um, and you can, there is a pocket there. So you can take that wire out. Like if you want to throw it in the microwave to make sure you've like um, disinfected it in a way as long as you remove that wire first. I didn't do that. And I had one of those vinyl covered <laughs> wires and oh my god it made such a bad smell so a little warning there I do make all the mistakes what I've learned in my design life is that so-called mistakes are just clues along the way and you just keep going and I just laugh whenever I do something really ridiculous like that like well oh, they say you fail fast yes, fail fast fail often yeah. and you come up with a solution so um, and then the last one, I'll just point out, Chuni, you're right. I am worried about, um, Chuni says she's uh, concerned about wearing masks as it gets warmer. And, um, you know, I know, Jen, in your design, you've thought about that as well. Do you want to just mention? Yes. Um, my mask, you can roll the remaining bandana material up and tuck it into the cord to get it off your neck if you're hot. So... Fortunately, because that material, it is a little bit more breathable. It's not going to be, I still can't imagine on a 90 degree day that anybody's going to want to wear any mask, but this one is more breathable and hopefully it, it will, it, we have to wear something. So I don't know. We, I may, that may be something I'll have to brainstorm next. Maybe like, what is the most lightweight mask we can get? Um, the other thing I want to start working on um, is children's ones because I worked in the in toys and children's gear and I know that you can't have all this the cords um, you have strangulation issues and things like that so I will be discussing that with some safety people to see what I can do maybe the kids ones still do have to just have the ear connection and kids aren't going to wear them constantly so that's okay more for somebody who maybe is working in a lobby or something that needs to wear that all day that that's a real issue for or a cashier you know well thanks Jen thanks You're so welcome. much, so much. Um, <laughs> and our last speaker I want to introduce is Adam Anderson um, you all well you should all know Adam's public work is uh, most public work is the 10,000 Suns. So it's the Sunflower Farm on the, uh, you know, 195 land over in the uh, Main Street East Side area. Um, Adam is a landscape architect. He has been um, also doing projects along the water that have uh, thought about the seawater level rise. Sorry, I got that. I, I, you all know what I mean, but um, but we're excited to have Adam because of his um, considerations 
around our landscape, but also, I don't know if you'll be able to speak to this, but Adam is working on a pretty special project in our parks. Um, so thanks, Adam, for being here. And we'll let you take it on. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, yeah, it's good to see some familiar faces um, that I haven't seen in a long time. So, okay. Um, so today, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to talk about um, public parks and a, and a little bit about the, just touch on the long history that, that public parks have played um, in response to uh, pandemics and, 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 and public health. And it's really even dates back to, to Roman times, but I assure you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go back that far. Um, so I'm a landscape architect here, here in town <clears throat> and my office um, is called Design Under Sky, a uh, small landscape uh, office. And I'm also an um, adjunct at faculty at, at RISD in the landscape department. Um, you know, for me, in, in terms of design, uh, landscape architecture is really this combination of, of working with uh, nature and culture and, and finding um, how those two kind of ne negotiate, communicate with each other. Um, so that means really designing natural systems as they come together with, with human systems. So nature, culture, natural systems, human systems. And I would say as a, as a landscape architect, there's, there's a spectrum of, of what we do. And, and, and I think there's a sliding scale, you know, depending on which landscape architect you ask, but it's often a combination of all of these as an artist, ecologist, architect, um, engineer and, 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 and gardener, um, and maybe even horticulturist. And some people might throw a couple of others in there. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a diverse um, mix of, of, of different aspects. Um, so uh, in, in, in some of my projects outside of Providence, I'm actually working on a lot of um, healthcare projects, some larger scale kind of campus hospital, things where um, uh, public health and healing gardens are, are very, uh, you know, a main component of, of the de design aspects. But, you know, um, uh, parks really, really play a, a critical public health infrastructure. Um, uh, and, and there's, a, I don't have time to, to get into it today, but there's a lot of, of data and research that, that you know, demonstratively shows um, not only the the physical well-being um, that uh, uh, open space is able to provide, but also the um, the mental health and well-being um, that it that it provides, um, and they really uh, fight against what it, what is considered lifestyle diseases. You know, your um, your obesity and, and and diabetes and even um, you know, heart disease and, and in some cases, uh, you know, cancer to help uh, alleviate some of these, some of these issues. Um, so they, uh, they become even more critical during our periods of, of this time when we're dealing with, you know, higher, uh, you know, higher stress and anxiety um, brought on by, by these situations. And um, and also, you know, we're conf you're, we're more confined, and, and many are not lucky enough to have their own kind of private uh, green space. So, you know, really, I think um, it's critical during this time we actually begin to even invest more and think about, um, you know, a sort of sort of a larger investment in in park space and during these times and how you know throughout history they've become. Uh, these ease uh, important kind of relief valves uh, to um, to urban areas in particular. It's hard to talk about parks in the United States without talking about um, this guy Frederick Law Olmsted, who you know is is by many considered the father of landscape uh, architecture. Um, prior to uh, really practicing as a landscape architect, he took on many uh, of his jobs, but one of them was as a editor for Harper's Weekly in New York. And this was during the time of the 
uh, uh, chol cholera outbreak that was happening in New York and many other places throughout the world. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the living conditions and air quality in the city were very poor at the time. And so this is really when people started to think about sanitation. Olmsted actually lost his youngest child to cholera. Um, and, and so this was a big motivation for, for creating Central Park. This is, um, as many of you know, Central Park is, is almost completely you know, man-made and artificial. Um, this is an early uh, picture of its, its development, but Olmsted was a big champion of uh, what parks could do in terms of, of, um, of public health in the city. And he understood uh, both the kind of mental and physical capabilities uh, that they have. Um, you know, and he, he would describe Central Park as being the, the lungs of the city. So this place where um, you could breathe fresh air, you could, you could feel kind of respite from, um, um, and repose from from city life, um, and um, you know, so so he was a big champion of that. And it's really hard to imagine, you know, given the density of New York City, uh, you know, the um, the city without without this. Um, and and actually, uh, uh, Olmsted during the Civil War was was uh, called. Um, asked to be the first ever uh, sanitation uh, commissioner and the newly created sanitation commission, which was started because uh, the Union soldiers were actually losing a large, large uh, number of, of soldiers uh, to, to diseases that were just based on bad en encampments, um, unsanitary living conditions. So Olmsted used his, his uh, landscape architecture uh, skills and sort of reconfigured and redesigned all these and, and, and <clears throat> saved actually many, many lives by re, um, you know, redesigning how water moved through the, the camp and how the latrines were uh, designed in a more sanitary manner. Um, I think many of us have been um, experienced uh, back bay fans and, and spots throughout the, the Emerald Necklace. Um, so Olmsted took some of these ideas of, of, of in infrastructure, health sanitation infrastructure, and, and the back bay fans is really, um, was created as, as a kind of a public health infrastructural project um, where there was issues with static water, disease causing static water, and, it, and this was a way to kind of move that. Um, and throughout its history, you know, it was used um, as many different things, cow pastures, uh, pre-modern sewage treatment ecologies, performance grounds, flood retention basins, and um, historical movements. Napoleon III, which was uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew, um, hired um, Eugene Hausman for a, to create a plan for Paris. And this, uh, was also a kind of a public health infrastructural project, among other things. Um, but really what, what they did is they, it was a big, big, big undertaking, and they cleared out. They wanted to do was bring fresh air into the city, and this was during the, the cholera uh, pandemic as well. And, um, you know, they created these large uh, boulevards, uh, green boulevards to bring fresh air into the city. And so you have this iconic um, streets that we still see today, these heavily wide planted, um, planted boulevards that are wide enough to also act as, as public space uh, in the city. Um, and within that, to, to a slightly lesser, smaller scale, um, you know, there remain these uh, uh, um, smaller streets that create the, also the iconic Kind of El Fresco dining um, to get people outdoor eating outdoors and, and on the streets. Um, so I, I think right now we're left with this, this interesting um, opportunity um, where you know Providence Planning just announced the you know is ab advocating for the slow streets movement. Other cities are closing down streets. Um, there's acres and acres of of uh, um, 
space that streets take up in city in cities and it presents an interesting opportunity for both restaurants and and these avenues as a as a public space that has been you know for so long dedicated and given up to mostly exclusively the automobile so an interesting uh, opportunity that 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 covid has presented us um, <clears throat> so I, I maybe you guys are are familiar uh, with with ten thousand sons. Um, if not, we're finishing up planting uh, this weekend. If you want to come out and join, um, uh, but you know, I've always uh, thought of this project as as um, the opportunity for participatory landscapes, uh, an opportunity for people to contribute in some way to the um, to the public realm and I and, and I was thinking about not doing the project this year but uh, you know I thought maybe this year was actually even a more important time to do it um, but we we also have to pivot um, in the way we do it last year in one day we had about 40 volunteers it's a it's a big undertaking um, and we obviously couldn't do that this year so we had to think about ways that we could um, have less people and still and still kind of do all of the work. So what I am, am experimenting with and trying to develop is, is this sort of, um, you know, adopt a section or adopt a plot uh, kind of mentality where, where people sort of, uh, and, and this can be anyone, can kind of take ownership of one of these sections. And, and I see it as a way that they can kind of come out and uh, planting seeds and gardening is a kind of a meditative act. So it, it, it's some, a way to get out of your house and a way to um, engage in the public in a, in a safe way. So these are from the last couple of weekends where, you know, we're, we're following CDC guidelines. We have less people and we have, we have masks, but we're able to, um, you know, we're able to, to get a lot of the work done, rel you know, relatively uh, quickly still. So there's been a, a good response. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, as we, if things time up right, as we come out of this thing that we'll, we'll kind of come out of our homes and the, and the bloom will be there waiting for us. These guys were social distancing three years ago, so they, they figured out um, how to do it. That's amazing. Um, another uh, project that was just installed last year, um, last spring, it was a collaboration with Down City Design um, and, and the Parks Department as well, um, Living Edge. Um, and Living Edge is really a, kind of a rewilding, a, a reforesting of a small uh, section on the, on the waterfront, um, located just north of Pedestrian Bridge on South Water. Um, <clears throat> and really, it's just kind of interesting. It wasn't designed for this current situation, but it happens to have some qualities that lend itself to to fitting in nicely. And that's really where how the intent was to create kind of more private moments to sit amongst a natural setting. Um, so they're separated. Um, so it, it it lends itself to allow people to to kind of separately sit. This was a participatory landscape as well. It started as, as this lawn um, and it was, it was entirely built by myself and, and volunteers. We planted uh, 22 trees, removed the sod and, and, and reseeded it with um, native wildflowers. So you get something that's a bit more kind of wild and untamed. Um, but what it does is, is kind of give you these little uh, kind of nooks for to uh, sit within this landscape kind of safely. And this we just kind of took advantage of the willow tree that was that was already there. It was, it was already creating an interesting space. We just provided the seating. And this relates back a little bit to what Libby was speaking to. Uh, again, another uh, a project um, <clears throat> that I designed the garden for um, for the Doom Brothers Seafood Place with, with, you know, by no means thinking about pandemics in mind, but the, uh, the space itself and the, um, the generous offering of a, of a large kind of garden as a dining 
uh, space lends itself to to being able to adapt to to um, <clears throat> you know the uh, Governor Raimondo's you know potential opening of of outdoor dining. Um, so uh, and again, this is just across the uh, pedestrian bridge. Hopefully, you guys have been there in the in the past past couple of years. And you know the space was designed as a as a as a social space, but just uh, having having some extra room, I think, will will lend itself uh, kind of easily to to beginning to able to adapt to that eight foot um, uh, threshold. So give us a little little taste of that um, thing that you know we've been kind of yearning for that social quality, um, and providing a bit of. Uh, green space for the for you know the kids and everyone else to kind of run around um, we'll see uh, you know of course we'll have to change some uh, some of the regulations and, and how many people are in there but hopefully this this adds to some of the the park space and gives a little release to to kind of socially engaging outside in a uh, in a safe in a safe way um, so um, and as, as Lisa alluded to, this is a little off topic, but I did because I'm excited about it and would like, you know, I'd like to share a no, new project that I'm developing with uh, Providence Planning and the Parks Department, as well as Inform Studio, who is um, uh, the architects of the, of the pedestrian bridge, who have been great to work with. And this is a new uh, uh, gateway, park gateway to um, to the uh, Roger Williams Park. Um, it's just north of, of the entrance on, on Broad Street. And really the idea is that this is kind of a new neighborhood uh, face um, uh, to, to the park uh, itself. Um, the programming within, within inside the actual park space is, is natural play and natural learning, um, as well as, you know, uh, kind of outdoor classrooms, and then there's a, a paved surface for uh, some some events and things, all all kind of focused around um, uh, the initiatives uh, of of the park. Um, so just some images of of the, the kind of schematic development of that of how that's developing. So um, thanks a lot. That was great, Adam. Thank you.